we begin our attempt to understand how scientific reasoning works by developing an abstract structure for how to interpret any report, any particular scientific episode of any sort. We begin with non-statistical examples and we'll turn to how to expand this way of understanding what goes on in scientific reasoning to statistical hypotheses in the second part of the course. So here we are thinking primarily about theoretical hypotheses. And first we'll talk about Geary's book chapters one and two. Some of this will involve the abstract structure itself, which I will focus on in this lecture. We will also look at some examples to which we can apply the structure. For the most part, though, I use the examples for class discussion. And since we're doing this course virtually and online, the discussion will have to be left to office hours. And I welcome your participation in office hours if you want to talk about some of the particular famous episodes in the history of science. So the most famous episode that motivates Geary's book is the double helix, the Crick and Watson double helix model of the structure of DNA. Crick wrote a book about this. And so we begin with looking at the book. Here's a picture of the title. Actually, I said, I said Crick wrote it, Watson wrote it. Crick was the younger of the two. But in any case, Watson writes the book, The Double Helix, famous book from the mid part of the 20th century. Instructively, that's when Geary was going to grad school and first learning about science. So I'm pretty sure that what motivated his interest in scientific reasoning and understanding its structure was something about this book. When you read the story as Geary gives it, what stands out to my mind in the story is first the role of background information in understanding what Crick and Watson were up to. There's all sorts of learning and presupposing of what has been learned that goes into figuring out what's going on when they're trying to understand the structure of DNA. The second thing is the role of analogical reasoning. They often resort to pointing out that in other areas of science, thinking along a certain way, along certain lines, turned out to be immensely fruitful. And so they try to do the same sort of thing. One of the most interesting episodes, one that I will talk about several times, happened in the 19th century concerning the perihelion of Mercury. The orbit of Mercury around the sun is not a consistent shape. It's, it has a little bump to it. That's called the perihelion of Mercury. It formed one of the primary mysteries of the 19th century that only got explained once we moved from Newtonian physics to relativistic physics of the sort that Einstein developed. But in the 19th century, analogical attempts to understand the perihelion of Mercury worked really well. And so what they did was they went back to, it turns out, to the discovery of Neptune. Galileo discovered Neptune by positing some unknown force that would explain the orbit of Saturn. It turns out Saturn, when you did Newtonian calculations and you predicted where Saturn was supposed to be in the night sky, it wasn't anywhere close to what it was predicted to be at. Now, nobody thought Newtonian physics was faulty because of this. Instead, what they thought was maybe they were presupposing certain forces in the solar system, and they were wrong in those presuppositions. So what they did was they calculated what would there have to be if there were another planet exerting gravitational force on Saturn, what would that planet be like? How big would it be? Where would we be able to see it in the night sky? And then they calculated what turned out to be 
the existence of Neptune and where it would be in the night sky. Now, it turned out they didn't, they, it's not visible to the naked eye, so you have to have a telescope, and there weren't good enough telescopes, so Galileo built one. And then he observed Neptune being exactly where it was supposed to be in the night sky. People weren't automatically convinced. Some of them doubted that the telescope was actually reliable, but gradually they came to see that, yep, it was good telescope and Neptune exists. So when you get to the 19th century and you notice another anomaly in the orbit of a planet, by analogical reasoning, you can look at the discovery of Neptune and say, hey, I bet there's another planet. In this case, a planet that we can't see by the naked eye or with the instruments we've used that's between Mercury and Venus. That planet was called Vulcan. So for, your, for you Star Trek-y fans, Vulcan did not first appear in Star Trek. It first appeared in 19th century physics as a posited planet to explain the perihelion of Mercury. That's a bit of analogical reasoning. You looked at the 17th century discovery of Neptune and you say, I bet the same sort of thinking would be useful here. We get that kind of analogical reasoning throughout the book, The Double Helix. So here's a quote. Crick's hunch was that the best strategy for discovering its structure was to build models as Pauling had done in discovering the structure of the alpha keratin. This time, Watson decided they should try two chain models, appealing to the general idea that important biological entities come in pairs. So both of these are examples of the kind of analogical reasoning that was at work. So we could compare that with the discovery of Neptune and the positing of Vulcan to explain the perihelion of Mercury. So the second thing is that Crick is a good self-promoter. He's been like this his whole life. He claims that they had discovered in discovering the structure of the DNA molecule, the secret of life. If you, if that sounds a bit hyperbolic to your ear, Yes, I'm on your side. The important thing, though, for Geary's purposes is that when we want to understand what scientific episodes are about, we have to pay attention to the notion of a model. This is part of Geary's enduring contra contribution to our understanding of science, is that we pay attention not to theories first, not to hypotheses first, but instead to models. So here's a description of the importance of models in science from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which if you're going to take any other philosophy courses, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is a gift. It's the most important encyclopedia for philosophical purposes that's ever existed. It began in the 1980s and has built itself up into absolutely first-rate stuff. There's never a bad article. Sometimes the articles are too complex for introductory purposes, but they're never, there's no Wikipedia tinge to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The people that write for it are first-rate people who understand they are experts in their field, so it's really good. So here's a claim about the centrality of models in science. The centrality of models, such as the billiard ball model of a gas, the Bohr model of the atom, the MIT bag model of the nucleon, the Gaussian chain model of a polymer, the Lorentz model of the atmosphere, the lotka volterra model of predator-prey inter interaction, the double helix model of DNA, agent-based and evolutionary models in the social sciences, and general equilibrium models of markets in their respective domains, are cases in point. The point of the quote is you should be overwhelmed by the way in which models show up everywhere in science, not just in physics, not just in chemistry, they're all over the place. Geary's understanding of science and the structure that we'll put in place for understanding scientific episodes centrally relies on the notion of a model. So here's some terminology from Geary. 
First, you want to know something about models, and Geary says there are scale models, analog models, and theoretical models. Models are in a general class of things that include maps, models, representations, abstractions, and similarity of structure. For Geary, the central terminology will be theoretical models, theoretical hypotheses, and theories. For Geary, a theory is a group or family of models, both theoretical and analog, together with theoretical hypotheses. So theories are not going to be the sort of thing that are true or false, because a group of models doesn't have a truth value. Theoretical hypotheses are the sorts of things that can be true or false. But a theory itself cannot be true or false on this way of speaking and thinking. A theoretical model is part of an imagined world. The part in question is some kind of abstraction from what the real world is thought to be like. So some theoretical models are accurate and others aren't. So we don't say that models are true or false. We talk about the accuracy of the way in which they represent reality. A theoretical hypothesis is a claim or statement to the effect that the model accurately represents the real world in certain respects. It is thus the vehicle by which the testing of models occurs. We formulate such a hypothesis and then see whether it is true. The other important distinction in Geary is the difference between data and information. This distinction will be blurred in some of our discussion, but it's important when reading Geary that you recognize the difference between his use of the word data and his use of the word information. Data is a subclass of information meeting certain experimental conditions, such as those involving physical interaction with the relevant system that is part of the world and reliable detection. So data is what you generate by conducting an experiment. If you're just not doing any experimentation of any sort, you might gather information, but data is reserved for what happens when we're engaged in experimentation. Next, in order to test a theory by establishing a theoretical hypothesis and running an experiment, for example, we have to know what a model predicts. So one of the first things scientists are going to need to do is generate a prediction. Using the model plus relevant background information to calculate what data is to be expected if the model actually fits the world in the ways imagined. Now once we do predictions of a model, we're in a position where we can confirm or disconfirm that model and the theoretical hypothesis in question by an experiment. In doing so, we need some notion of confirmation. And here we have two centrally different notions of confirmation that are related to each other, but there's incremental and absolute confirmation. And in the language of probability, we have the first, we have incremental confirmation between some data E and some hypothesis, just when a certain probabilistic inequality holds. So what this says is, the probability of H given E is strictly greater than the probability of H itself. So here we have an unconditional probability on the right side of this inequality and a conditional probability on the other side. So the way to think about incremental confirmation is you're looking for a piece of evidence generated by an experiment that you ran that raises the probability of the hypothesis from what it was before you generated the data by running the experiment. So incremental confirmation is a matter of probabilistic enhancement or elevation or raising. That's the fundamental notion associated with incremental confirmation. What about absolute confirmation? Notice that incremental confirmation can be present even if the amount of evidence that you generate is woefully short 
of enough to make it reasonable to believe the hypothesis in question. So for example, just take a simple dice example. You have two dice in your hand and you're trying to see whether or not you roll the dice and you're trying to see whether it came up at 12. Now you don't get to look at the dice, but you have a machine that detects the state of the dice and gives you information about it. Now the probability that it came up at 12 is one over 36 when you start if your background assumption, if your background information includes that the pair of dice is a fair pair of dice. Suppose then that you learn that the roll came up with a number larger than the number eight. So it came up either a nine, 10, 11, or 12. That data incrementally confirms that it came up at 12 because the conditional probability of it coming up at 12 given that it came up a 9, 10, 11, or 12 is greater than the unconditional probability that it came up at 12. When we get to the probability section, we can actually calculate what that probability is, but it's obvious that it's gonna be higher. But notice it's not gonna be high enough to make it reasonable to believe that the number came up at 12. So if we want absolute confirmation that it came up at 12, we'd need something more than the kind of incremental confirmation that I just, that I just described. So for that, what we need is when, for absolute confirmation, we need that the probability of H given E plus our background information K exceeds a certain number R. K is all of our background knowledge and R is some threshold high enough for whatever epistemic state confirmation is supposed to generate when we have enough of it. So maybe what we're thinking about is when do we have enough confirmation for rational belief or justified belief or knowledge or for putting you in a position to know even if you don't actually know it for whatever reason. So all of those count as epistemic states because the word epistemic is from the Greek word episteme, which is usually translated as knowledge. So something connected with knowledge. We want to know when do we have enough incremental confirmation in order to know or reasonably conclude that something is true. And for that, we need basically a threshold some threshold R, and maybe it's vague, maybe it's not the same number R in every context, but in any case, that's the formal structure. We will look for some threshold when we get that far. But initially, our focus will be on the probabilistic inequality, understanding of incremental confirmation in order to understand scientific episodes and the kind of testing involved in such an episode. The important part in chapters one and two, though, are the components of a scientific episode. So what you can think of here is that Geary is trying to present us with a structure for interpreting any scientific episode of any sort. It doesn't have to be physics or chemistry. This is going to apply to all of them. So it's a perfectly good structure according to Geary, to make sense out of what's going on. It also gives you resources for telling when reporters are not doing a good job when they tell us about a scientific episode. Because if you can't fill in all the parts of the structure, the, science, the report is simply incomplete enough that you don't know what to make of it. So what are the first big four elements? The first big four elements are first there is the real world or some aspect of it that a scientist is trying to understand. Second, in order to do this, the scientist develops a model. The third and fourth parts are what we get from testing. From the model, we have to get a prediction of one sort or another. And then once we do an experiment or gather some data, we'll be in a position to assess how accurate the model is to what the real world is like. 
So the first big four elements in the structure that aims to understand how scientific reasoning work are the real world, a model of it, a prediction from the model of what to expect when we run an experiment or take a look at what the real world is like, and then the data that we generate when we take a look at what the world is like. In addition to the big four elements, we get arrows connecting the boxes. So the real world and the model obviously fit together. The data in the prediction are obviously related to each other. We get our data from the real world, so we have an, uh, an arrow pointing in one direction from the real world to the data, and we get a one-way arrow from the model to the prediction. The prediction doesn't generate the model, the model generates the prediction. The data doesn't generate the real world, the real world generates the data. But we get interplay in both directions between the real world and the model and the data and the prediction. What are these connections to be understood in terms of? Well, we start with the real world, the model, the data, and the prediction. The model either fits or doesn't fit the real world. So that's the first connection that we see. And when we formulate a theoretical hypothesis about the connection between the real world and the model, that hypothesis is either true or false, depending on whether the model fits or doesn't fit the real world, the part of the real world being theorized about. When it comes to the connection between data and prediction, the data and the prediction, again, either agree or disagree. The connection between the real world and the data is a matter of experimentation and observation. And the relationship between the prediction and the model is a matter of reasoning and calculation. So those are our arrows. Now, this model is supposed to generate a program that can be used for assessing any particular scientific episode. And it's a program that has four steps. The first four are the basic parts in question. Tell if you're gonna apply the program, state what part of the real world we're talking about, be able to characterize the model, say what the data is and what the model predicted. Those are the first four steps in the program. In order to understand how this program works, there should be some sense of how the model generates the prediction in question, rather than just being told that the model predicts X. You'd like to know what kind of reasoning or calculation leads to that. And then you'd like, when you see what the data are, you'd like to see some explanation of the kind of setup that was used to generate the, the data. What does the experiment look like? What were the steps that were taken in the observation that led to the characterization of the data? You then are going to assess whether the data in prediction agree or disagree and that will tell you something about whether the model fits or doesn't fit the real world and whether the hypothesis was true or false. So those are the things that are going to be used when we get to steps five, six, and seven. So step, the first four steps of the program involve this diagram, generating this diagram, and especially characterizing step one, step two, step three, and step four. Once we have those steps characterized, we can move on to the reasoning part. So the first thing we ask is, do the data and the prediction agree? If the answer to that is no, if the data and prediction don't agree, then we've got evidence against the fit between the model and the real world. So either the answer is no or yes to the question of whether the data and prediction agree. If the answer is no, Geary's program has us conclude immediately that there's evidence against fit. We will see that that is a bit of 
an abstraction from reality later on, but let's go with it right now. So if the answer is no, we've got evidence against fit. If the answer is yes, we can't conclude anything yet because we need to ask a further question. Was the agreement that we found likely? If the agreement is not likely, Geary tells us, then we have evidence for fit. On the other hand, if the agreement was likely, independently of the model and the prediction that it generated, then we really don't know what to make of anything. We are in a state of indeterminacy about what to think about the model. The idea here, which we will see when we get to probability theory, the more surprising the data, the better its confirming power. So if you say, I have a theory of X, I don't care what X is, and I say, oh good, how do we test this? And you say, well, my theory predicts that the sun will come up tomorrow, so let's test it. Well, we get up before dawn, and look at that, the sun came up. What do we say? Now, if this is a pet theory of yours, you'll wave your hands and jump up and down and say, see, I told you so. My theory is true. The right response to that is, look, we didn't need your theory to make it reasonable to think the sun's going to come up tomorrow. We don't have any reason to believe your theory on the basis of something so obvious as that. So the confirming power of the sun coming up, that's consistent with your theory, but it doesn't confirm your theory very much, if at all. So that's the motivating insight in Geary for this step six question about whether agreement is likely. If agreement is likely, you get little to no confirming power. And so your attitude toward the model is an indeterminate one based on this particular piece of data. On the other hand, if the agreement is really surprising, we get something else. If the agreement simply wasn't likely at all, then we have evidence for fit. In the best case, it would be conclusive evidence for fit, but we're not talking about that right now. We're just talking about incremental evidence. So those are the seven steps of the Geary program. It has two parts, part one and two, where you just lay, lay out the basic structure, and then part two of the program, where you investigate what to be made, what's to be made of the relationship between the data and the prediction, whether it's evidence against fit or evidence for fit or simply indeterminate. Much of the discussion of the first two chapters then is an application of this structure first to the Watson-Crick model and then to others. So I'm going to proceed through this without explaining a lot of it. You can read about the examples in the book, but the important thing to see is how to set up your diagrams to make the particular scientific episode fit the example under discussion. So in the false start, the false start for Watson and Crick was not the double helix, but the triple helix model. In both cases though, regardless of the model, it's the structure of DNA, which is the part of the real world under discussion. So the three chain model was the false start and steps three and four, the prediction from the three chain model about the percentage of water content in DNA is what was calculated. And then the actual water content, now Crick and Watson didn't actually do this calculation until after the embarrassing episode when the famous scientist said, you're not going to be able to get the water content right on this model, which meant they had actually spent a lot of time constructing a physical model that had three chains. So it's a lot of architectural work to build the model. And it all crumbled very fast because of this issue about the water content. So because the water content in the actual data and the water content predicted didn't fit, you conclude that the three chain model doesn't fit the real world and hence the hypothesis that it does is false. And you get the other parts of this 
first stage of the program where you fill in step one, step two, step three, and step four with the arrows running between steps one and two and three and four and between one and three and two and four. The two chain model did much better. But again, we fill in the parts of the diagram in the same way. In this case, the data and prediction are not about water content, but about actual x-rays. X-ray patterns that are expected to be seen according to the two chain model. And then what we find is that there's a match between the two. So we get positive evidence for the two chain model from the actual x-ray. The only thing that this doesn't address is the question about whether the actual x-ray was to be expected or was it surprising. In the absence of the two chain model, there was no particular reason to expect the pattern in the actual x-ray that was observed. So it counts as unexpected data. And so you get some degree of positive confirmation for the two chain model from the experiment. Other applications in chapter two concern first turtle migration. So we get this 1250 mile migration of turtles from one land mass to another. And we want to know how did that happen? The model appeals to plate movements. And the data and the prediction is that in order to get this 1250 mile migration to be explained, by a model that involves tectonic plate movement, we'd need an age, we'd need a time period in the past where the migration happened about 40 million years ago. The actual data though is that it happened 20,000 years ago. So we get a failure of fit between the aspect of the real world under discussion and the model that was posited to explain it. We then fill in the arrows. And the important thing to note is the data in the prediction don't agree. So that counts as negative evidence. So the hypothesis is false that the model fits reality. So we conclude that the model doesn't fit reality as long as this is strong enough evidence, but at least we have incremental evidence against the view that the model fits reality. One further example takes us into the realm of disreputable or marginal science. And this is about the role of the unconscious. So the idea is we have a model of perception where there are unconscious elements that are functioning to make us good at guessing. So if there are unconscious elements at work in our understanding of perception, then our guesses should be better than chance. And it turns out the data that was generated was that we were 90% correct. And so we get some evidence here, a positive fit between the data and the prediction and so we have some incremental evidence that there are unconscious elements at work in perception. It turns out this was originally thought to be disreputable science, but the data shows us that somehow, sometimes, even in areas where our eyes are not able to detect things to our best understanding of how eyes work, we generate information which is better than chance. There are famous books about these kinds of blind spots, one of them by a former colleague of mine, Roy Sorensen, here at WashU. In a book called Blind Spots, he investigates some of this evidence. One further example is the greenhouse gas effect. Now, remember that this book is dated. We have much more data on greenhouse effects than the data that was used in this particular example. So what we're interested in is an aspect of the climate. And the idea is the greenhouse model explains that the world is warming up. 
Now the prediction is that on the greenhouse model, temperatures will be increasing. And the only data that Geary uses in this case is temperature increases that happened in the 1980s. So the greenhouse model fits what's happening to the climate because the data from the 1980s agrees with the prediction of the greenhouse model. Remember though that when we get agreement, we're supposed to ask whether the agreement was to be expected. And on this case, there's an alternative model, the Lorentz model, which also predicts the same temperature increases, so is compatible with the data that we have. And so Geary uses this example to give us a case where data and prediction agree, but we don't get any, or at least not very much, incremental confirmation for the model. I include this example in our discussion just as a cautionary note, because the book sounds as if it might be defending a right-wing agenda about climate change, but it's actually not. It's just limiting the data to a particular subclass of our total information, and it's a subclass of information that was available to Geary when he first started working on this model. So that explains why using only dated and limited evidence, we'd end up with evidence that's neutral with respect to the fit between the climate that is part of the real world and the greenhouse model that we're trying to confirm. Those are some examples. We usually spend time in class talking about the particular details a lot more than I'm going to do here. We can talk about the details if you wish during office hours. The last thing we need to talk about from chapters one and two is, the, is brought up by the last example, because notice what we appeal to in the last example was an alternative model to the greenhouse model when it came to assessing whether agreement was likely or not. What that does is it introduces the idea of contrastive confirmation. So what you have is two different models together with the real world, and you're comparing the data that you've got with respect to each of those models. So you had the greenhouse model and the Lorentz model and the idea was the evidence that we had was equally fitting for both of the models, so it doesn't give you evidence for the greenhouse model over the Lorentz model. So we've already talked about incremental and absolute confirmation. The second distinction is the distinction between contrastive and non-contrastive confirmation, or the distinction between relational and non-relational. In the first explanation of the Geary program, this distinction is not attended to at all. So on the original Geary program, the evidence can be positive, negative, or neutral. For positive and negative relevance, we can't conclude that the hypothesis is true unless the kind of confirmation is absolute confirmation. Incremental confirmation merely raises the probability of the hypothesis rather than showing it to be true. Neutrality arises when the prediction matches the data, but there's an alternative model that predicts the data as well. That's what happened in the greenhouse model case. In such a case, we don't get contrastive confirmation for the first model over the second, though perhaps there's a small amount of incremental confirmation present for both. Note, however, that in both incremental and contrastive confirmation cases, they come in degrees, so we need a way to measure how much of each quantity we get in a given testing situation. In order to characterize that, it's worth looking back at the history of inductive logic a bit. So inductive logic begins with the idea that inductive generalizations are sometimes warranted. So if you see a black raven and then another raven and it's black and a third raven, after you've seen enough ravens that are black, maybe you're in a position to generalize and conclude that all ravens are black. 
This is called sometimes enumerative induction. You get a whole bunch of instances and you're warranted in concluding a generalization. For that to work, perhaps you should think that each instance provides a tiny, tiny bit of incremental confirmation for the generalization. And when you get enough instances, it all adds up so that the generalization is warranted by your statistical sample. A second approach to inductive logic focuses on hypothetical induction. For this, you begin your theory of confirmation with the idea that hypotheses being tested predict evidence. Sometimes this is called sometimes the high school model of how science works. You look at a theory and you try to see what it entails in the form of experience. Entailment here may be too strong, so maybe entailment's the right word, but at least prediction is relevant. So you look at the hypothesis and you see what it predicts, and then you run your test. Now notice hypothetical induction of this sort isn't gonna give you a measure on the degree of support being generated if the data and the prediction agree. It'll just be an on-off switch. Either you get confirmation or you don't, but when you get how much you get isn't going to be revealed in this way. To measure the degree, you're going to need some notion of probabilistic induction. Begin your theory of confirmation by appeal to the notion that the evidence for a hypothesis makes that hypothesis more probable than it is apart from the evidence. Once we have this approach in place, we can characterize comparative confirmation, relational confirmation, in this way. So you've got two hypotheses, think the greenhouse model and the Lorentz model, and you've got some evidence. And you want to know, does that evidence favor one of these hypotheses over the other? How do we tell that? Well, we just ask whether the evidence confirms one of them more strongly than it confirms the other. If you like symbols, we'll use the bolded C for our confirmation relation symbol. So does the confirmation relation that holds between E and H1 strictly exceed that for the relation that holds between E and H2? Now, the important question is how we're going to characterize this particular notion, because notice that's a non-comparative notion. We will understand the comparative notion by generating some kind of non-comparative understanding of confirmation. Here's a very brief characterization of the history of statistics. So here's some potential possibilities for what the non-comparative notion of confirmation is to be understood as. We know we have this basic underlying probabilistic inequality. So we want the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence to exceed that of the hypothesis itself before you had the evidence. So how do we measure the degree of confirmation generated? One very simple answer is just subtract the second from the first. Maybe the measure of confirmation generated is just to be found in this way. There's another subtraction idea that you might use instead. Instead of subtracting the unconditional probability of the hypothesis from the conditional one, maybe you should subtract the conditional probability of the hypothesis on the assumption that the evidence didn't hold, that the data wasn't what you actually found it to be. Notice both of those simply involve the operation of subtraction. And you can look at the history of the development of statistics, which begins in about 1925 in a book by Fisher. You can look at the history of discussion of statistical reasoning in terms of ways of trying to assess whether either of these conceptions are adequate.
or whether we need something more complicated? And the answer is yes, we do need something more complicated. Here are some further options. Both of the next two involve ratios. So what kinds of ratios? Ratios because we're using the division operator on the probabilities in question instead of subtracting. So we're no longer subtracting, but we're rather dividing. So maybe what we want, here's a simple ratio one, just divide the conditional probability by the unconditional. Now remember, if we have a case of confirmation, the top number that one should be strictly larger than the bottom number. So we will have some number greater than one generated by the ratio conception. And then if you're comparing the degree of confirmation generated for two different hypotheses by the same evidence, you just look at the two numbers that are both gonna be greater than one and you ask, well, does the one number exceed that of the other number, and by how much? Then you'll know whether you have relational or comparative confirmation of one of the hypotheses over the other. Here's an alternative, though. This is called the likelihood conception. The likelihood ratio conception divides, again, just like the ratio conception did. But notice what we're doing is flipping the evidence and hypotheses around. So we're not dividing the probability of H given E, but rather the probability of E given H. And we're dividing that by the probability of E given not H. Now, if you noticed in the Geary program, once we get down to step six and seven, we're interested in the question of how surprising the data is. The likelihood ratio conception feeds off of that way of understanding things. Because if the data is unsurprising, then the probability that we're talking about here, the probability of the data given the hypotheses, the hypothesis in question won't be higher than the probability of the evidence given the falsity of the hypothesis. So when you have confirmation, you need the data to be surprising. So the top number should be greater than the bottom number if the data is surprising. Hence, this number, this ratio, will exceed one when and only when there's confirmation of the hypothesis by the evidence in question. When the data isn't surprising at all, you won't get confirmation. That's the key element involved in the move from step six to step seven in the Geary program. The account of non-comparative confirmation that makes the most sense of this stage is the likelihood conception. That gives you one reason for thinking the likelihood ratio conception of non-comparative confirmation has something going for it over the others. We're not gonna spend time evaluating each of these four and which one is the most promising, but it's fair to say that moving from the difference subtraction conceptions to the ratio and likelihood ratio conceptions mirrors the development of understandings of confirmation in the history of statistics. It doesn't mean the likelihood ratio conception is without difficulties and controversies, but it certainly has advantages over the other conceptions. In any case, whatever you say about non-comparative confirmation, you need some notion of non-comparative confirmation in order to characterize comparative confirmation. And it turns out that most scientific episodes are best understood in terms of some notion of comparative confirmation anyway.
Whatever we say about this, of course, we're still going to need some threshold of non-comparative confirmation when we ask the question of whether we should endorse one of the hypotheses over the other one. So we'd have to come back to this question about threshold at some point, but we're not going to do that yet. We're still stuck at the level of incremental confirmation. Now, once we have such a theory, we can explain the notion of a crucial experiment that Geary discusses near the end of chapter two. Crucial experiments are wonderful things in the history of science. It would be nice if we had more crucial experiments rather than suggestive experiments. So a crucial experiment is designed to generate evidence relevant to contrastive confirmation, and it's strong enough evidence to surpass whatever threshold we needed so that if things go as planned, absolute contrastive confirmation is generated for one of the models over the other. We might also say that if these are the only two models available, then such absolute contrastive confirmation counts as absolute non-contrastive confirmation as well. Such a contrastive notion of confirmation helps as well to explain Geary's notion of model development. When a test generates absolute non-contrastive disconfirmation of a model, changes are often made to that model, and then we envision the test results as providing contrastive confirmation for the new version of the model over the old one. So here's a particular example, the example of two models of mutations, which is a really important one in the history of science. So we have two models of mutations in bacteria, one caused by the phage virus itself, the other model that it arises by chance. The crucial experiment involved test cultures, all injected with the virus, with the prediction being if the former model were correct, there would be more immunity in all the cultures. But if the mutations were arising by chance, the second model, some should have more than others, depending on how early in the process the chance mutation occurred. The data generated by the experiment showed wide divergence in the percentage of immune ba bacteria in the various cultures. So the experiment disconfirms the first model and confirms the second and provides contrastive confirmation for the second model over the first. A second example, the cooling of the Earth. The old model said the Earth is four and a half billion years old and took seven tenths of a billion years to cool sufficiently to support life. Such a model predicts that examining the chemistry of a grain of zircon that was formed 4.4 billion years ago would show that it was much too hot to allow for condensation of water, which is needed, of course, for the formation of oceans, and that's required for life. The experiment disconfirmed the model, showing that the grain could only have been formed in a low temperature environment. So you change the model. The new model designed to accommodate the results of the experiment says that the cooling occurred in 0.1 billion years instead of 0.7. So comparing the old and new model, the experiment provides strong contrastive confirmation for the second model over the per first, perhaps enough to conclude that the second model gets things right. That's speculative though. The important thing to master though is how to construct a diagram for such contrastive testings. And notice we're going to have some of the same elements that we had before. We're going to need models and predictions. We're going to need the real world, but we're also going to need a second model. We need both model one and model two, and we need also the predictions associated with each together with the data generated by the experiment that we run. The arrows will work roughly the same. We're interested in the degree of fit between the models in reality. And to generate an answer to that question, we calculate predictions. Predictions from the first model, predictions from the second model, and then we run our experiment to see whether we get agreement between the predictions of each. And of course, in the good case, the predictions will differ strongly and we will set up the experiment to generate conclusive evidence 
in favor of one over the other. And that's what we find in contrastive situations. The ideal of contrastive confirmation situations is we are looking to construct a crucial experiment. So if you have two models in mind and two predictions that disagree strongly with each other, that's what you're looking for. In succeeding chapters, chapters three and four, we'll look at some famous episodes from the history of science that talk about this particular kind of contrastive testing that goes on in science.